<clears throat> Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are merciful, patient, loving. We don't deserve any of that, and yet you do. You you care for us. You um, you want us to care for others as you have cared for us, and we don't, and you still care for us. And So we thank you for that, and we ask that you draw us ever closer to you, help us to recognize your word and, and the, the value of of, of your, your spirit speaking to us through that word to uh, give us strength and courage and, and hearts for the gospel we, and for our neighbor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> All right, Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, before we start, I've got a news article. Um, this is just a couple weeks ago. Russia decides to search for Sodom and Gomorrah in Jordan. Oh. Um, uh, Russia and Jordan have signed an agreement to search the bottom of the Dead Sea for the remains of the biblical cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, according to the report, a Russian company has agreed to conduct the search in cooperation with Jordanian authorities, picking up all costs in exchange for exclusive rights to film documentary of the search. The report quoted one of the Jordanian heads of the project as saying the search would begin in late December. Um, so, yeah, uh, biblical archaeologists have several theories as to where the uh, Sodom and its associated cities were located, according to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, uh, specifically Genesis. Um, God overturned Sodom, Gomorrah, and three other cities because of their degeneration, sin, and iniquity turning a once fertile plain into a stark wasteland. Abraham, who prayed for the cities, was unable to prevent God from mandating their destruction. Archaeologists and geologists have suggested that a major earthquake or meteor storm might have been the means by which it occurred. Research is centered on the area around the Dead Sea in the modern city of Sodom and nearby Mount Sodom, which is made almost completely of rock salt, is considered the most likely site of the ancient cities. However, some archaeological evidence has emerged that indicates the site could be on the east bank of the Dead Sea, which two sites in Jordan, I'm not going to try to pronounce them, uh, both considered viable candidates. The Jordanian-Russian search will center on one of them, which also has several Christian monuments. So, just, you know, kind of interesting. Um, also mentions uh, uh, <clears throat> some things that were found in NASA photographs. Uh, indicating the bottom of the sea is littered with debris and objects not found in other bodies of water, and so they want to examine those, find out what's in those, what those photographs are finding. Um, and since it's on the Jordanian side of the Dead Sea, they need to get permission. Do you know if they started? Uh, it just says, yeah. The, well, this is a. Um, or is it the December of twenty eleven? Um. This was 14 December 10. So this is in mid-December that this came out, and it just says we'll start in December, so I would assume that that means they've started by now. So I guess watch for the documentary. I'm sure that if they find anything, it'll be all in the news. So, um, so yeah, it could be interesting, uh, because I've heard a lot of, uh, as I was... Um, researching this um for tonight i was i saw a lot of um oh suggesting the cities never really existed and because a lot of people think that abraham never really existed and um you know when you get to lot's wife and the pillar of salt thing there's a lot of salt pillars all over the place around there it's just sort of part of the um the the salt uh Environment. Yeah, it's just part of the environment. But there is one in particular that is commonly referred to as Lot's wife, which may or may you know it's that's if you call it that, then you can get tourists to come. So you know wh <laughs> whether it's that one or one of the other ones, or 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 the one that she turned into is long gone, and you know which is probably the most likely. Um, so. It's kind of like looking for Noah's Ark. It was made of wood. It was thousands of years ago. What are the chances they're going to find it? If, yeah. You know, if if they didn't dismantle it and, you know, build houses out of it, um, then chances are it's rotted by now. So, 
All right, so... It seems like a study's coming from an unusual place, though, doesn't it? From well, Russia. Yeah, and, and this is actually... This news article is from the um, Israel National News. Um, but, yeah, it's the fact that Russia, you know, I suppose there's money to be made. <laughs> um, you know, I'm sure. This, this would be a pretty major fine. Oh, yes. Yeah, so... Not like crying in the ark, but pretty, pretty close. <laughs> yeah, pretty close. I mean... What it comes down to is if if they do find it, it will, it'll, and and if especially if they can find anything that would indicate not just that these are some ancient cities, but that this actually is Sodom or Gomorrah, or you know that there's some sort of connection there, like through, they probably have to find some pottery or something like that 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 has engravings on it that hasn't been completely you know washed away and stuff. Um, if they could find something indicating the name of the city or, or something like that, that would be, you know, really huge. Yes. Yeah, um, like a sign, welcome to Sodom, yeah. welcome to Gomorrah, you know. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe they could find the arch over the gate. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yes, I, I'm, I'm joking, but I understand what you mean. Yeah, so that, you know, they may well find it and people will say, well, it's just an ancient city, you know. This doesn't prove that those things actually existed or anything. I know they won't. And what it comes down to is, they could find a, a, they could literally find a sign, you know, engraved on a, the wall of the city that says Sodom or something like that, and and people would say, well, that's that was just they had the writers of Genesis had heard of the city of Sodom. Um, and passed on this story and, you yeah. know, or whatever. You could have an eyewitness in there. Yeah. And that what it kind of, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. You could, they, if they find Noah's Ark, all right. Same thing. Same thing. They'll say, say you found a boat. Yep. Yeah. It just happens to match the dimensions in the Bible. <laughs> so that means that somebody was up in the mountains at some point and saw this thing and stories spread from it. And, you know, I mean. If, if you don't want to believe it, you can come up with a way around it. So. <clears throat> and it's really not even that tough. <laughs> I mean, people, you should see the, you know, some of the things where we know it. In fact, yeah, I mean, one of my favorites is that they say that David never existed. And, um, and then they found a piece of pottery dating from his time period that referred to David. And they were, no, that's you're lucky you're reading the letters wrong. That's dode. It's uh um it's a uh, uh spelled wrong. Here's well, well it, because of the way the Hebrew is, it could be read that way. So you go, who's dode? <laughs> well it's a fertility goddess. Really, what makes you think that? Well it can't be David, so <laughs> so you know, just sort of like pulling this stuff out of the air. You know? I, I agree. There's no other mention of a dode anywhere and in ancient writings or anything like that. But that's got to be it. <laughs> it couldn't be David. And then they found the walls of Jerusalem dating from Solomon's time when there wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be an organized enough society at that point that they could have walls. Could even build a wall. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, uh, I don't know. Last I heard, the jury's still out on that one. They haven't come up with an explanation. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right, uh, Genesis 19. Someone want to read? The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered. We will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all of the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet, with, uh, to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, 
No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of the get out of our way, they replied, and they said, This fellow came here as an alien, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept, they kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they stuck, then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, son-in-law? sons-in-law, sons in or daughters, or any one else in the city who belongs to you. Get them out of here, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against his people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his son and sons-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, Hurry and get out of this place, because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But this, but his son and sons-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angel urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, and you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of the, of his wife and his two daughters, and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please, your servant has found favor in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me, and I'll die. Look here, look, here is the town near enough to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said to him, very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town was called Zor. By the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities, and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the, of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities, of, the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Lot and his daughters. Lot and his two daughters left Zor and settled in the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zor. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. One day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man around here to lie with us, as is the custom all over the earth. Let's get our father to drink wine and then lie with us and preserve our family line through our father. That night they got their father to drink wine, and the older daughter went in and lay with him. She was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. She was not aware of it. He was not. 
He, oh, he was now cancer. The next day, the older daughter said to the younger, Last night I lay with my father. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight, and you go in and lie with him, so we can preserve our family line through our father. So they got their father to drink wine that night also, and the younger daughter went and lay with him. Again he was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The older daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger daughter also had a son, and she named him then Ami. He is the father of the Ammon Knights of today. All right. <clears> that <throat> strikes me that Lot says to the to the men of Sodom, "No, don't do this evil thing." <laughs> <laughs> like, you really should have listened to his own advice. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but we'll get to some of that. All right. So, even though Lot chose Sodom, he's still called a righteous man. Second uh, Peter two seven. And if you rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man living among the day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the law of deeds he saw and heard. So just a, kind of a side note. Um, so Peter's making an example here, and, and without going into the whole thing, he specifically refers to Lot as a righteous man who's... who's tormented by this this city. So but he chose Sodom. And and we saw earlier that Lot moved closer and closer to Sodom. At first he was just sort of on the plane and he kept moving closer to the city. Finally he was living in the city. Right? Um why is he called a righteous man? But he saved the men. Okay. Because right. he was related to Abraham. <laughs> related to Abraham. Okay. No. <laughs> I don't know. All right. You know this is this is a tough thing, and then, here's the thing. This is um, we we look at Ed Lot and and we see that that Lot is really sort of um, really to me at least he seems torn. If there's there's serious advantages to being in the city. Uh, I mean, for one, just living in the city, you're protected by the city walls and that. Um, and he may have even, you know, since Peter talks about how he was sort of tormented by the sin, that maybe it was, um, he hoped that he could make a difference in the city. We don't really know. I mean, from Lot's actions up to this point, he seems pretty self-centered. And so... It's really hard. But one thing that we do see about Lot is that he does have faith in God. Even though he doesn't always live it, Lot is a man that, that believes in the true God. Um, and when the angels show up, he recognizes where they're coming from. And, um, and, and so he is a man of faith. I mean, he, he went along with Abram. And, and left everything and well didn't really leave everything sort of took everything along with him but um, but he did go along and follow to sort of paths unknown so so he's a man of faith just not a man of great character right so in 19.1 it says that they arrived at Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city what was he doing in the gateway of the city Working. Okay, yeah, actually he was working. Right? Anybody know what the city gate was? What was special about the city gate or why somebody would be sitting in there? Mm -hmm. That's yeah, where they do be. all the business, the city business. It was yeah, yeah. yeah. Was it was the there. equivalent of the courthouse. So this means the lot was on the sort of council of the city. That he was uh that's where they settled disputes and, and things like that. 
So that means that you know a lot. You know, later on they refer to him. Oh, you're you're not from around here or whatever. But he, they knew who Lot was. He was a a prominent member of society. So why? Oh, this typo. But why did Lot insist on the angel staying at his house? I believe he, he did believe. He did have faith. He just did, didn't love it. And uh, that was that was custom. Right? So remember, he did. Remember we saw um, when they showed up at Abraham's house, he was like, oh, get some food and, you know, all yeah. this whole hospitality thing. All right? Here we have Lot. And what does he do? It's the whole hospitality thing. Like, oh, no, 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 that's fine. We'll just sleep in the square. Don't, you know, don't put yourself out. And no, no, I insist you will stay in my home. I will, I will show you hospitality. I will care for the, you know, the wandering stranger sort of thing. Um, and, you know, even, even if he didn't recognize that these guys were angels, um, which, it, you know, they didn't show up with, you know, wings or fiery chariot or anything. Um, but, uh, but, these guys, he showed them hospitality. Right? So, why did Lot offer his daughters to the mob outside? I'm going to refrain from responding to yes. that question. <laughs> That's really she you was guys, a pimp. <laughs> you guys can take this one. This is, I mean, this is one of those... Prostituting his daughters. Yeah, I mean, th this yeah. is... What? What are you doing? <laughs> I knew when you read that you were gonna uh, <laughs> you were gonna ask us. And yeah. I don't have a clue. Yeah. Why would you do that? I would just don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here, take them instead. All right. But all right, I think we get a, a clue from from their reaction. He says, "Here, take my two daughters." Hey, they're virgins. And they say, no, not interested. We want the men. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. I'm a homosexual. They didn't want... I didn't think they cared. <laughs> no, yeah. No, you notice it's the men. The men and young and old men. Not all the people or, or something like that. No, I mean, the people saw them. I didn't know they were particularly cared whether they were men or women from yeah, some right. of the things that I've read. But yeah, when when he offers, they they said step aside, you know. Um, so you think he offered his daughters because he knew they would turn them down? Kind of seems like it. Yeah. Based on the fact that they did, he knew these guys. They were into guys. <laughs> so you you see why this isn't uh, it, it's sort of a well known story from the Bible, but not one we usually cover in Sunday school. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and if and if you do cover it in Sunday school, you've got to, I mean, <clears throat> you you sort of pick about three verses and <laughs> like, all right, you get the gist of it. There was there was some bad people there, and God rained down fire. Okay, end of story. <clears throat> Not actually gonna have ask anybody to read it from the Bible. We're just gonna give you a quick summary. <laughs> Now, you see where the fallacy is that it took me until I'm 75 years old to know why, because nobody would talk to me about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but but you know what? The, um, there's there's more to it. And the thing is, when, when it is talked about, um, well, and, and it's where we get the word sodomy. Um, and But the thing is, there's more to it than that. Oh, wow. Hold on. Look. I've been looking for this. <laughs> I just I've been looking for this for a couple of weeks. <laughs> Sorry. What is it? It's my voice recorder that I use for that I set on the pulpit when I um when I record my sermons. And uh so that's amazing. Well, it's sort of, you know, it's miracle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's black and silver. It was sitting on that Blends black right and silver in. computer. It's <laughs> completely blended in. I've been 
Turning the house upside down, <laughs> turning my office upside down, looking for that thing. Sorry. <laughs> this is more That's than okay. the Bible. I'm happy you got it. <laughs> All right. Um. All right, so... Now, here's the thing. It may be that, that Lot knew that they weren't going to... They didn't want his daughters. Based on the reaction, that seems to be the case. It could be that um, that his sense of, of hospitality was so strong that um, that that he would defend his guests over his daughters. But that seems well, unlikely. That. <laughs> no, I don't think that's so. Or <laughs> or that somehow his um, his sort of moral center was so messed up from from being in this community. I, knew that. I mean, ultimately, we don't know why he did that. Um, they're supposed to be virgins who are engaged to be married and and if the men got a hold of his daughters and they were no longer virgins, that probably would be the end of the marriage, probably. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, since back then, um, and, and still in some countries today, but uh, in a, a lot of those ancient cultures, um, after the wedding night, you hung the sheets out to show that yep, they yeah. were virgins. Oh, it's really kind of creepy. But <laughs> yeah. A lot of that's strange our, customs. Our, our Western sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So why did Lot have so little influence over his sons-in-law? Oh, I don't know. All right, he's going, come on, they're going to destroy the city. Ah, no, they're not. You can't fool us. I mean, and and he obviously spent some time with them because it was um, they arrived in the evening and it was it was sun up when finally the angels say, "All right, let's go." All right, so he's you know it's it's he's spending several hours. We don't know how long this whole sort of riot thing um, lasted, but there was some time that he was arguing with his sons-in-law saying, um, guys, really, just just trust me. If it turns out to not happen, you can go back. <laughs> All right? Is it possible that in a suggestion in my father that they thought he was just fooling around, not that he was lying or they didn't believe him? Yeah. They just they thought he was, maybe he was that kind of a person he was. Maybe Could he be. did stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, you, you tricked us last time. We're not going to fall for it this uh-huh. time. I thought it was just some practical joke or something like that. Yeah, it sort of seems sounds like that's what that's what they thought. And I mean, you'd think that over time that no, really, you know. So when when they finally left and the angels are sort of dragging them out of the city, you just sort of picture the sons going, "We're not fooled." <laughs> yeah. Wow, you guys are really taking this joke long ways to try to convince us. I don't know what else to say. That just sounds like it to me. All right, and then in verse 16, it says, uh, When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand in the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city. All right? Why did he hesitate? I don't think he wanted to go read it, did he? No, he really... Well, he had everything he had there. Everything. Yeah. yeah. He was... Everything he owned was there. Yeah. You think about it. He was it. a material <laughs> kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was, wait a minute. You're going to destroy the city. All my stuff is here. <laughs> if you're dead, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, right. <clears throat> As the, the, the story goes that... um um. When Mount Vesuvius destroyed the city of Pompeii, and they <clears throat> sort of dug it up, they found a, um, a woman inside of a house. That the, the, the or, uh, as they sort of cut through the the solidified lava, um, they found the the body or skeleton of a a woman. Um, in a house clutching 
some piece of jewelry where they sort of gathered from what they found that she had they were fleeing the city and all of a sudden she realized she there was this piece of jewelry back in the house and it was going to be destroyed and so she went back for it and didn't get out in time and you know you hear stories of, of things like that people in fires and, and things like that Running in to save their cat or something like that. Yeah, or, you know, even... Not even... Yeah, it could be a, a, a piece of jewelry, you know. Yeah. There was a... I, there was a... I was having a discussion with some people. It's sort of one of those water cooler topics. All right, if your house was burning, you could grab one thing, what would it be? Oh, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, you know, assuming your family is, is safe, yeah. you have know, just enough time to, to grab one material possession. You know, what would it be? The Bible. Oh, see, I wouldn't grab my Bible, because I can always get another Bible. <laughs> um, so I'd, I'd grab my laptop, because uh, I don't have an online backup of most of it. <laughs> um, I know my wife would, would grab as many uh, photo albums as possible, but I've got more pictures on my laptop and, and her laptop than we have in photo albums. <laughs> Well, the ones in photo albums are older, so it's kind of a toss-up. <laughs> but uh, I think the photo albums make the most sense, though. Yeah, I yeah. think that's the only thing photographs. <laughs> I mean, I have backup from my computer, but it's from here to your purse, away from the computer. Mm -hmm. So if the computer goes, it goes too. Right. We yeah. used to always say, like, if we'd go someplace, I'd say, "Oh, I think I left the iron plug there," <laughs> and Greg would say, "That's why you have house insurance." <laughs> He goes, we're not there, so nobody's going to get hurt, so right. it really doesn't matter, you know. That's the only thing I would, you know, when people have floods and the mudslides and everything, but I don't even think we can grasp tornadoes and they lose everything, you know, and in the rubble they'll find we had a, that. Yeah. When we had a flood here in 88. We lost everything. We lost, uh, fortunately, we didn't lose the pictures that were upstairs, but we lost all the movies, all the 8 millimeter movies we took of all the kids as they were growing up and everything. And they were able to salvage one piece of it, and it was about 15, 20 seconds long. We still have that. <laughs> but, yeah, we, we lost that stuff. And my Bible. <laughs> I accidentally taped over the first year of Kimberly's life on videotape. It wasn't uh, labeled properly. And Teresa is uh, still speaking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually told her once I discovered it, too. Because, which was probably uh, dumb. But <laughs> we, this, the tape just disappeared. And we couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. And then there was this one that we had recorded a movie off the of TV. And and I rewound it, and um, and I mean it was labeled the the side of the table was labeled with the name of the movie, and um, and I and I I put it in I I can't even remember what I was doing I, was, I think I was checking to see if there was anything else on the tape or something like that, and right at the beginning, there's this this like two second clip of us sitting on the couch talking to the camera <laughs> with Teresa pregnant with Kimberly. <laughs> and it was like a couple days before, you know, that we were like going to say this little message to her or whatever. Or <laughs> baby, where, you know, we didn't know where to go. Or, and, and I saw that and I went... <laughs> 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 I think it was a little while before I actually told her and worked up the guts. To her. <laughs> yeah. Felt horrible about that, and then I was just going, "Why did we not pop the little record tab off of that one and yeah, label yeah. it?" You know, yeah. it baffles me to this day how that happened. <laughs> but um, all right. But this this ties in with the next question: Why was Lot's wife punished? She didn't listen to what God told her. What's that? She didn't listen to what God told her. All right. So don't look back, but Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Right? Now, 
understanding that this uh, this concept of looking back, it's not that she just wanted to see the fireworks. Okay. the The idea here is that she looked back longingly. Like, did we really have to go? Okay. And and sort of the idea is that she preferred that corrupt city over God's will. And so her heart was still there. Totally different spin on the Tony Bennett song. My heart and Sam was just <laughs> You and I were on the same way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, destroying two insi- entire cities seems harsh. What warranted it? Was it warranted? Or, I'm sorry. What? Sorry. Was it warranted? That good because that next question didn't make any sense. Then was why? <laughs> okay. All right. And so, to understand this, all right, we just read this passage from. Um, what this, what we witnessed going on in Sodom. All right, there's a couple other passages that we need to look at. All right, Ezekiel 16, 48 to 50, and Matthew 10, 11 to 16. Got one of them, go ahead and read it. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, your sister Sodom and her daughters never did what you and your daughters have done. Now, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them. As you have seen. All right. So, what was their sin? Well, arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. Okay. They did not help Selfish. the poor and the needy. They didn't help in the poor and the needy. Right. Matthew, somebody grab that one? Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it to your give it give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If It is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet. When you leave that home or town, let uh, tell tell you the truth. It will be more bearing for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. <laughs> so, the, um, how, are, how is this, how is Sodom and Gomorrah referred to here in <laughs> reference to what? Why does he mention Sodom and Gomorrah connected to this? Well, if the people aren't going to listen to the word, they, then they're, uh, that's why they're uh, related and used in relationship to Sodom and Gomorrah because they didn't listen to God's word either. Okay, All right. I don't know why they say... Sodom and Gomorrah will be in better stead than someone who doesn't listen to your word. I don't know any saying that. Well, in other words, um, in other words, they're worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. <coughs> wow. 
So, but they didn't do it either. So I don't understand why. Well, in, in other words, it's like well, they've they've had the warning. Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have the same warning. Okay. All right. That's something that, that Jesus does a couple times where where he'll say, um, you know, there's another place where he says it would be better for Tyre and Sidon than Capernaum, I think it was, um, or Nazareth. Because he says, look, you, you guys had the message preached to you. They didn't. Okay. Um, so, you know, you should have known better. And in this case, these cities, they should have known better because they saw what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, right? okay. So... All right. If they they won't listen to the word, and, and what's the other thing that that these cities are supposed to do when the disciples come? Welcome them in and do just exactly what Lot did. Yeah. All right. So both of these cases, both Matthew and Ezekiel, what are they talking about? Hospitality, caring for the wanderers, the strangers, the um, you know, the people in need. See, I, I see this over and over in um, groups that are the sort of real outspoken anti-homosexual groups that they focus on Sodom and they focus on this bit where um, about the will send out the daughters and they don't want the daughters, they want the men. All right, And they focus on that and they say, well, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because of homosexuality. There was such a horrible sin that, that God destroyed the cities because of that. Well, Ezekiel says that, no, it was because of you didn't care for the poor and the needy. And, and, um, and that, that attitude just led to all kinds of horrible things. So really the, um, that the, the sexual perversion was just a symptom of the bigger problem that, you know, because really what they, what these guys, I'm not even sure that this was really homosexuality as it was some sort of rape, which is not a, a rape is not a sexual sin, it's a violent sin, right? Because it's not done out of, to meet some sort of physical need, it's to exert power, right? When you get into abuse situations and stuff like that, it's, it's all about power, right? And so here's some wanderers, and, and we got we to gotta show these guys that we're in control, that we're, you know, yeah, show them power, you know, you think of where that becomes really obvious. You hear the stories about prison and stuff like that. It's all about it's about pecking orders and, and things like that. And um, and, and so so really, the the whole sort of homosexual thing that's secondary at best. But that's the thing that everybody sort of hones in on. But if you look at where the Bible talks about um about Sodom and Gomorrah and other places. No, it's really the hospitality thing. And so then when you look at when you look at that in the context of what did what did Lot do? He welcomed them in. All right? He's called a righteous man. Why? Because he welcomed them in. Because when they said, No, that's fine, we'll just go sleep in this in the town square, he said, Uh uh-uh, uh, you're staying with me. Because that is my duty. My duty to be hospitable. Right, so we see that Lot wasn't completely self-centered, but we also see this. You know, what what was the story we had right before this? Abraham. <clears throat> and what is what does Abraham express? Hospitality. All right. What's the answer to the question? So, was it warranted? Yes. But well, yes. these guys, they were definitely not <clears throat> hospitable. <clears throat> All right? <laughs> they said, Welcome them into your home. No, send them out so we can rape them. That's a that's a heck of a welcome wagon. I mean that's a can you imagine a city that their their culture is is based on, you know, that oh boy, if someone happens to wander into that city, what's gonna happen to them? You know, it's up to God when it comes to judgment. That's a pretty rough city. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty, that's that's really the Reader's Digest version for sure. 
Yeah, it, well, there's a lot more to it than yeah, just well, that. You know, the point is like, okay, this is we'll tell you enough so you kind of need to know what's going on. Yeah, you really don't want the details. Okay. I mean, it's it's bad. It's already rated R. <laughs> <laughs> Um. All right. So, and I, I think I already answered the next question. Oh, I see that now. Okay. How does Abraham's and Lot's reactions to the visitors compare with this reason? Right. They've been, um, you know, they showed hospitality. <laughs> so that leads to the next question: Is what lesson can your house learn from Sodom and Gomorrah? Them more hospitable, right? You know, think about the poor and the needy in our town. Think about the, you know, the the people that are uh, that are strangers here, the the people that are um, have some kind of needs. The whole point is that it's about um, <clears throat> going out of your way because we're, you know, these angels. They said, "No, no, no, we're good." He said, "No, really, let me help you." You know, the, our our tendency is to, if we see somebody in need, it's like, hey, you're right. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Good. Because yeah. <laughs> I didn't really want to stop and help. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's sort of like when when you say how you doing. Nowadays, we've we've even gotten to the point where where the um the 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 expected response. Usually isn't even I'm fine. How are you? It's just hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Oh, they don't okay. even answer, right? You, you know what? I, tell, I got to tell you a little story. I'm really guilty of that. Bad. I'm I'm bad because when we went to see Bonnie, I asked her about her dog, and I can't stand that little yeah, <laughs> little dog. <laughs> and I asked her if her dog was okay. And, and the last thing I wanted to tell me was, can you do that dog? <laughs> <laughs> but I was still concerned because it was her dog, but uh -huh. I don't want to take care of that dog. <laughs> so I was happy to hear her say, no, her boy was taking care of the dog. So the same thing you're talking about. Huh? You know, I asked, but I didn't want to answer. And and how many times do you just do you, do you see somebody, whether it's somebody that, that you know or just, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, um, some you're in a social situation somewhere. Oh, hey, how you doing? You know, whatever. And it's just it. You say it, but do you mean it? I mean, do you, if they if they said, I gotta tell you, I'm I'm doing horribly. I you know I, I just got this diagnosis. My spouse just left me. Whatever. Like you yeah. know, would you go? You know, what would your reaction be? Would it be? I'm so glad I asked. You clearly need somebody to talk to. Or would it be? Next time, I just say hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all know what we hope it would be. <laughs> right, yeah. But, you know, we're easily distracted. And, and you know, when you, when to, to really connect with somebody's life, and, and especially when things are not going particularly well, when they really need somebody, that takes, that takes work on our part. Yeah. Now, see, I would have taken the dog, but I wouldn't have wanted to. <laughs> sure. All right. Um, this also, the next question sort of connected with this is, what lesson can your church learn from Sodom and Gomorrah? This is something for us to think about, it, and I think it's something that we've been kind of talking about lately. Um, not necessarily in the, in the same terms, but... This is the question that all churches should be asking on an ongoing basis, is how can we be more hospitable to our community, to, the, to those who are passing through, to those who, you know, that are in need of some kind of help. And, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, some sort of financial help, I was something I've been thinking a lot about just in the past 24 hours, is... Um, you know, even if somebody stops by and they just need some food or something like that, and and we, you know, give them a gift card or whatever, I think that's great. Um, but at the same time, if we only give them that, 
are we doing our job as a church? Is there, you know, is there a way to say, here, this will help your immediate need, but really tell me what can I do? Let's, you know, let's see about seeing to your needs more long term. Let me help you get connected with, um, you know, whatever social services you need, whatever financial help that you need, you know, whatever it is. How can I be more hospitable to you? And some people, um, I mean, a lot of people, they don't want the help. They they just want the quick fix. A lot of people, they've gotten themselves in that situation in the first place because they're always just looking for, I just, you know, want to get through today and I'm not going to do any long-range planning. But at the same time, you know, are we even offered? What can we do to to try to be more, to at least offer that to everybody who's willing to accept it? I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if we do or not. Well, I think that's something that we need to be talking about as a church. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Um, all right. So, if this upsets God so much, this this lack of hospitality, this lack of caring for people in need, what does this tell us about the character and priorities of God? That's what he cares about. Yeah. You know? This is, he cares yeah. about everybody, right? I think if there's that there's one thing the 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 standard interpretation of this is God wants to zap the gaze <laughs> is not right. Right? <laughs> I think if anything we get from this is that even if you're um if you are not a, a sexually pure sort of person like lot right <laughs> that god still loves you and while clearly um the this next episode about lot and his daughters um is not sort of go and do likewise um yet god still loves lot Um, and in fact, um, oh, we'll get, we'll get to that in a second, but how we see this character in the ministry of Jesus. We see Jesus going, um, you know, Jesus spent a lot of his time in Galilee. That's the worst he, part of town is where the people needed the most help. Yeah. The poorest people. The poor the sinners, the, the 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 modern term is marginalized. <laughs> oh well, that makes it sound pretty, doesn't it? <laughs> and you know, we should the uh, you know probably a, you know better term would be the you know the sort of skid marks, the people that have been driven over, right? Um, and and in fact, in our society, I would consider the homosexuals as part of that. Group that feel ostracized because they're not accepted, and that they're they're told that they're bad and all this kind of stuff. Now, the, you know, does that mean that that God says that that acting on those tendencies is is okay and good? No, all right. But we've got to do everything we can to reach out and love to those people instead of just um, sort of stomping them or you know carrying signs around and protesting them. Or, you know, or whatever else. And, and the Christian church as a whole in America has done a horrible job of that. Carrying signs? Well, no, not, <laughs> not so much that, but but of, of, of reaching out to people that whose lifestyles are not um, in line with what God would have them be. Or, or what, you know, or even in, in some cases, what we think they should be, which isn't always the same thing. Um, but you know, we, we, we expect people, it's sort of like, all right, if you want to be a Christian, first, you got to get your life in order and then we'll tell you why, <laughs> then we'll share the gospel with you. But first you got to get rid of all that, you know, all that bad stuff. Well, why should I, you know, but if I tell you about Jesus and the love that he has for you 
and, and offer you, you know, something more, then maybe you, you've got a reason to say, well, hmm, God is really great. How can I live for him? You know, but if they don't know how great God is and they just see him as a condemning judge, then what's the point? Well, I'm not going to please him anyway, so. I don't know that I've ever done that. Well, you may not have. I, but I sort don't of. Know. I don't know that we do. I, I can't. I only know one person. Two people. That are funny. Kind of. I don't know that I ever treated him any different. And, you know, not everybody does. And, and, <clears throat> I wonder if we do as a church. I don't, I don't know. I would guess that this congregation probably not as much. We tend to be pretty accepting of sort of the fringe, so to speak. But I can't say we ever had a couple come in as a couple. No, and, and how would how would the kind yeah, of what we react? would do? Yeah. Could always hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I think men Just I think welcome. it's really weird. <laughs> men seem to think that that men queers what you want to call them. Oh, gross, but women queers, it's okay. I've never understood that. We do that, don't we? But yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's like sort of embedded in our culture, too. I, I don't understand that. You know what I don't understand is that there's so many kids in high school who say they're queers. Why would they even say? I don't understand why you would even say something like that to anybody. Well, in some parts of, of our culture, it's celebrated. It's seen as preferable. That's a, you know, that's a whole another topic that we're already running late. Yeah, so. okay. <laughs> it, it, I hear it a lot with from the kids, and I just wonder, thinking back in school, we probably had some funny kids in school. I don't know if they ever declared themselves that way. Well, probably not, because it's a lot more acceptable nowadays than it yeah. used to be. I'm probably thinking further back than I realize. Um, just real quick, I want to hit these other ones. Um... You know, given Lot's actions, how can you still be called righteous? Right? Yeah, it was bad enough with the daughters there in those previous chapters, but now... Yeah. Come on, really, Lot? No, you had no idea. Yeah, you know, you kind of wonder about that. Like, was he... Did he think it was his wife or something? You know, or was he that drunk? Nobody's that drunk. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. I'm sorry. Nobody's that drunk to not know they're having sex with their virgin daughters. <laughs> well, I, I, just, <laughs> I would say from a man's point of view, you no one is that drunk to father a child. You know, if he's may, that drunk, yeah. Yeah, no. somebody may be playing with him. Or he might not him. remember it the next morning. <laughs> yeah. There you go. But yeah, at the time. It's hard to believe. Yeah. Right? Um, now, the, the children were the Moabites and the Ammonites, right? And uh, those passages there, basically, they were better, they ended up being bitter enemies of the Israelites. Um, so, yeah, this led to long term problems. At the same time, who else was born as a descendant of this union, right? And the, the first reference sort of gives it away, and it's Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite woman who married an Israelite man. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, was an Israelite, right? And she ended up also marrying Boaz, who was an Israelite, right? And then they lived in Bethlehem. And, um, and let's see, if I remember my generations right, uh, he gave birth to Jesse, he gave birth to David, who, if you keep following the line down, you end up with Jesus. So, one of Jesus' um, ancestors, at least in, in one part, is, um, is, one of his ancestors is a Moabite, and so, yeah, he could actually trace his lineage back to Lot's daughter. Oh. To this, this union. 
which that sort of thing and 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 um so so that's mentioned that he had a, a moabite as his um as one of his ancestors um uh, rahab the prostitute from the exodus she was one of his ancestors he's got some pretty shady characters um you know he he's not a, a sort of clean purebred or whatever kind of term you want um there's there's plenty of people in his in his history that um, you wouldn't necessarily be proud of. I was just talking to somebody last week that said I was doing some genealogy research and I just found out that um, that one of my ancestors owned slaves, and, um, and he said that was that was really disturbing for me mm. uh, to know that that my one of my ancestors, one of the people that that are, are that I'm descended from, owned human beings. And, and it was just, it was a real shocker. Uh, yeah, I can, uh, I had a little story to tell. My, I had a, I had an uncle who was really meek and mild and, and, and we were always very, uh, we didn't, we weren't prejudiced in any way that I know of, that I ever really thought I was or anything. And, and when he died, uh, and he was just a little guy and, and and he had a big wife that dominated him. But anyway, when they went through the uh, the house after he passed away, they found a Ku Klux Klan robe in his closet. So <laughs> completely, completely out of character. So I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, but yeah, Jesus wasn't afraid to call these people family. Uh, and that says something right there about his character. That, um... And, and what we see from God, that, that God made a point of making sure these things were recorded in the Bible. Jesus came from sort of bad stock, or whatever you want to say. Um, you know, he comes from a long line of sinners. He came to identify with sinners. He came to be one of us. That doesn't mean that he was a sinner. Yes. But but he was one of us. And, and that's the thing. All right. Any other questions or comments? Let's close with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we don't deserve it, but you invite us into your house, and you insist that we come and, and stay with you, and it's just such a, a tremendous blessing. Enable us, uh, not only give us opportunities, but help us to see those opportunities to share the blessings that you have given to us with others to, to show uh, true hospitality um, at, at every opportunity that all may experience your love, know your love, and through that love, know you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.